I enlisted in the Naval Reserve uh, at 0730 hours on my 17th birthday. I was trying to get in before World War II was all over. In fact, I tried a year earlier on my 16th birthday and, and claimed that I was 17, and they just kind of laughed and they said, well, your, your father will have to certify that. And my dad said, uh, you're too old for me to tell you what to do, but I'm too old to lie for you. So I came back a year later, and so five years in the Naval Reserve, on active duty and in reserve, I dropped out of high school to join, and then finally I smartened up and went back and finished high school all through college. I was in the Naval Reserve, and then got drafted into the Army in, in the Korean period. Uh, and was an enlisted man for several years, a total of 10 years between the Naval uh, Reserve and the Army as an enlisted man, uh, during which time I was a counterintelligence agent and taught at the Adjutant General School. Uh, then I was commissioned as a military police officer, and so the, this was my first commission here. Uh, and then after I completed seminary, I applied for the chaplaincy, was commissioned as a chaplain, and so the last 28 years of my military service was as an Army chaplain. I was retired, really against my will, but by the law, on my 60th birthday. So 43 years in between, uh, about a quarter of the time was on active duty, uh, and even the last eight years of my, life, my military service before retirement, I was on active duty on and off 75% uh, of the time for special assignments. So in a, in a capsule, that's the whole the sort of thing. The uh, first four months of my military service was the last four months of the World War II. And on 31 December 1947, everything was over. And I, I rem the funny thing I remember most especially is that we had to start putting postage stamps on our envelopes. We were in a special program for Naval Reserve people coming in. We are at Great Lakes in boot camp. Uh, most of us had dropped out of high school to join, uh, trying to get in before World War II was over. Today's young people really cannot understand that. Uh, as to what the, the attitude was during World War II, where absolutely everything was dedicated to winning that war. And so no matter what you would do, you had to be there. And those who were in uniform were heroes to me. And so I, a, a teeny silliness of it, but our uh, petty officers that, that ran the boot camp were all World War II veterans uh, and hardened in some ways. And uh, technically, uh, we were World War II veterans, and they gave us the World War II Victory Medal, and, and it really ticked off the, uh, the men who had really earned it. And it was kind of an embarrassment to us. Uh, I still am in awe of genuine World War II veterans. And, and I will not consider myself that, even though technically I am. In World War II, there's a lot of glory. Uh, some of it was artificial, some of it was imagined, but a lot of it was genuine as well. And I observed that. Uh, my boyhood hero was uh, Jack Cook. Jack Cook was one of my father's Boy Scouts. Um, uh, and my father was a scoutmaster, and I later became, he later became my scoutmaster. But Jack was my babysitter uh, because my dad uh, knew him. And Jack went into uh, the Army Air Corps, became a pilot. Uh, Jack was from a very poor family, had very little prospects, but it became commissioned. And I can remember on his first uh, furlough after winning his wings, sitting there in my living room, looking at his uniform, looking at the, the pillar 
and the wings in his lapels, looking at the second lieutenant bars on his shoulder and looking at his uh, silver wings on his breast and just admiring him. Jack was assigned to flying the hump from India, Burma, over the Himalayan mountains to resupply Chinese, uh, American forces fighting with the Chinese in the heart of China, because that's the only way they could get supplies in there. And Jack went down. We still don't know what happened to him. His plane crashed and no remains were ever identified, if even found. After all, after all these years, it still hurts. But, but it's part of what made me become a man. And I wanted to take Jack's place along with it place of others. <clears throat> I came to understand military people as persons and their families. And I learned, and actually my experience as a military police officer also helped me because I could see what misbehavior did to soldiers. Uh, and, and I, I understood them more. And, and so I wanted, one of the things that taught us as military police officers in the Provo Marshal General School at Fort Gordon, Georgia, uh, was to look at soldiers as people. And uh, we were to teach our MPs that they were more to protect soldiers from themselves than they were from what they did. And uh, we, were, we taught them that their job was not to catch soldiers in trouble. And, and so that, that concern for the personhood of soldiers uh, was in the background to my becoming a, a chaplain. I never got to Vietnam, although there are two or three times I was set to go. The time came during the uh, uh, Johnson administration where our training division on active duty at Fort Dix, New Jersey was notified down through the b b b uh, regimental headquarters level that you will be ordered to active duty as a whole division uh, as soon as Congress adjourns for the summer because then President Lyndon Johnson will use the uh, vacation time to order you to active duty so that congressmen won't have to face their constituents with their having uh, passed the order. They'll blame it all on the president by executive order. But the time came when he got cold feet, as it were, and thought, and, and Lyndon Johnson thought, I cannot bear this responsibility all by myself. If it's not shared by Congress, I will not do it. So we barely escaped. We, were, we even knew where we would be assigned uh, to active duty. Another t uh, part of that, I learned later from the Office of the Chief of Chaplains, if that had happened, I would not have been stationed stateside. I would have been raw meat for Vietnam. Uh, as a first lieutenant company level chaplain, I would have been ordered immediately to active duty. I have a sense of guilt that I was never in combat. Uh, on one level, I feel that it was my obligation. I don't have a right 
not to have been in combat. Uh, I don't feel guilty because it wasn't my f fault. Uh, I, I w would have gone if I were ordered, but I was not ordered. Yet, when I became uh, on the, the clinical pastoral staff of two medical centers in the Army, uh, I, I dealt with men whose lives had been ruined by their service in Vietnam, uh, who were living with emotional and even moral wounds from having killed people, having been involved in that. And in several cases, I was the first person to whom they ever opened up because they were dying now. Not, not always of their wounds, although sometimes it was a delayed result of the wounds, or more frequently, another illness or another injury that had developed that would not have developed if they had not been wounded, uh, an associated illness. <coughs> and it was the last opportunity that they had to talk to somebody. And in some ways, It might have been if I had been exactly, if I had gone through exactly what they would have gone through, I might have been more involved in this. I broke up in just talking about Jack Cook. Uh, I broke up in talking with them too, listening to the stories. And in some cases, as far as I know, I was the only one to whom they had opened up because they died shortly thereafter. The veterans for whom I, I'm most distressed. During World War II, and even in Korea, um, a lot of people killed, were killed and, and they died on the battlefield. Medical science has developed to the point where people in World War I, Korea, and even some in Vietnam, would have died on the battlefield, have survived the battlefield, but they've never recovered. And not only they are living a life of dying, so are their families. And the people, the people who have to take care of them, the wives, who never received their husband back, the children who never received their fathers back. In, in, in some ways, I, I, people can be forgiven for thinking they'd be better off if they died on the battlefield. And it's our job to make sure that's not so. It's our job to help them to recover as much of a life that, that we can help them to recover. And, that, and for all that medical people do for them, for all therapists do for them, they are their old heroes. Because a person can never come through that, a paraplegic, uh, and, and harder to deal with, is the emotionally and mentally disturbed, and they still survive. There's, there's no Purple Heart for that. And the Purple Heart they got for physical wounds is almost inconsequential to what they do deserve. And I stand in awe at them. I, I, just do not understand. My younger son, uh, younger of two, we have three children, uh, grew up uh, seeing me as a soldier. He, he admired me as a soldier. Uh, he used to maintain his own uniform. Uh, I bought for him, uh, he wanted to play soldier. Uh, and, and I managed to get for him the smallest pair of uh, 
combat boots the army makes, and it's for whack, whack women. They were wax then women. The smallest pair, and when he was probably in kindergarten, and he was so proud of those, he just barely fit into them. He could hardly lift his feet on it. So then he followed my military career. He went with me uh, to the Army. Uh, I, I stayed a, uh, one weekend drill. He went with me and stayed in the BOQ, stayed in my own bed. And there he was in the bed snuggling with his Army teddy bear. Uh, and uh, he maintained his own uniform in, in, the, in, the, in the closet. Uh, the smallest fatigue uniform that was made, and he promoted himself from second lieutenant up through captain, putting different emblems on there at a certain period of time. Uh, he joined the National Guard, Minnesota National Guard, as soon as he was eligible. He's still in high school. He he went to boot. He went to basic training. Um, as a high school student, he went to the first half of basic training, uh, then applied for an ROTC scholarship and won a uh, four-year ROTC scholarship. Uh, as an ROTC cadet, uh, he went to jump school in the Army, went, went, uh, earned his jump wings, went to the second half of basic training the first time that anybody there had ever seen a recruit wearing jump wings. And, and his, uh, even his, uh, most of his uh, NCOs did not have jump wings. Became an armor officer, went through armor officer basic course. Uh, went to Germany with the second armor division. Uh, was uh, then the division sent to the um, to Iraq, uh, well, to uh, Kuwait first. My son was in the wave, the first wave that met the Republican na uh, uh, guard of the Kuwaiti army. Uh, he went in, they advanced in, and uh, he looked at his watch and recognized that at that time, back in the United computed, Back at that time, churches all over America would be praying for them, and that sustained him. And the, the day that we heard on television that um, <clears throat> the war had started, I held a crying mother and a crying grandmother, and we prayed, but all I could get out is, Lord, Stephen, I, I had explained to my wife all of the precautions the Army uses in combat to keep people safe. And all of that was true. But I also knew what I didn't say, all that can go wrong in combat, because combat has never ever in history gone the way it should. And I knew that he could be killed. And my wife said to me, are you just telling me that so I don't worry? And I said, yes. He came home, but I kept wondering, what if that sedan shows up in front of the house? And I see two officers get out, and one's a chaplain. I'll know what had happened. And I would say to them, I know. But what I agonized about is what would tell my wife. Because I would feel responsible. This is not logical, it's emotional. 
I would feel responsible. I would want to feel responsible. And that I don't understand. I would want to feel responsible for my son's death. And I didn't know how I would react. I didn't know if I would react the way that I tried to encourage other people to react. Teenage kids um, who were the age I was when I was considering going into the military, when I wanted so much to go in. Um, there were things that I did not understand then, and I could not have understand then, I and mean, I don't expect teenage kids now to understand these things. But listen to me, and bear it in mind, because someday you will understand. Uh, I highly recommend that any young person consider military service, to consider at, at least an initial tour, not necessarily a career, uh, because you, you, you cannot know whether it should be a career until you have some uh, active duty experience. Uh, it's a matter of just growing up. You, be, you can become an adult very quickly in, in the military. And the military will force on you adult responsibilities. This in addition to just being a good citizen. But we don't want anyone. We don't want everyone. A primary qualification for competent military service is to hate war. And to hate hurting people. If, you, if, the, if, if combat excites you as an adventure, we don't want you. If you enjoy hurting people, e even emotionally or, or verbally, we don't want you. We don't want you on police departments. We don't want you on fire departments. We don't want you anywhere where you need to use force. We want people who love other people. We want people who, if you need to harm people, it kills you to harm them. I wasn't in combat, so I didn't deal with people immediately right after they've killed somebody. It was years later, but I have dealt with police officers as a police chaplain right after they had shot someone. Their supervisor said, you need to see the chaplain, and we'd spend time together. The people I worried about is a police officer who is so hardened, he wouldn't let it bother him. That's the one I worry about him, because he's killing himself. I am encouraged by the police officer who is killed by what he has just done who feels it morally. We want soldiers and airmen and Marines and sailors who are willing and capable of balancing moral sensitivity to the evil that they commit with a social responsibility of being responsible for other people. So, Moral sensitivity, but social responsibility. That's the kind of person we want.